Hello, my name is Dr. Pamela, and you are watching The Joy Whisperer, where we explore the science and the practice of joy as a catalyst for our resistance, our resilience, our relationships, and our restoration. Today, we are going to be talking about the pursuit of joy at work. In this day and age, there are so many different expectations for our experience at work than there ever has been before. And I'm gonna talk about some of those things and what it takes to actually create an experience of joy in the workplace. And we're gonna look at this from the standpoint of three truths. So truth number one, people want jobs and careers that enhance their quality of life. Now, with the opportunity to work online or to integrate technology into the work that we do, people are seeing opportunities to build upon their personal lives and add value to those lives outside of work. So how can our careers help and aid in the quality of our lives so that we can enjoy more leisure and also be able to take care of family members when those needs arise? So that's truth number one. Truth number two, identity in the workplace matters. Now, if we're being honest, everybody in the workplace does not have the same experience. There are differences that are really um, infringe on our freedoms based on our race, our age, our gender, sexual orientation that changes the experience of work. And the third truth is that we can pursue thriving businesses with friends and family. Now, I know there's a lot of myths that say, I don't know if that's true, but I'm going to show you exactly how that can happen. So we have a great show ahead of you today. Grab a friend, grab a pen, and let the joy whispering begin. So today's theory to live by is by one of my favorite researchers, Dr. Brene Brown. And you know, she we know her as the researcher that talks about shame, resilience, authenticity. But one thing that we don't often hear about is this concept of foreboding joy. And this is that idea that when things are going really well, you know, we just got that job we've always wanted, we uh, got the promotion, we got the marriage that we wanted, whatever it is that we've just really wanted to happen in life and we're on our high in life and suddenly these feelings of fear creep in that say you know this isn't going to last or when is the other shoe going to drop there's something bad going to happen on the horizon because nobody stays this happy for this long so instead of really diving into the joy that we experience we instead begin to worry about what can go wrong and when things are going to kind of spiral downward and go sour. So it's important as we think about pursuing joy in our work, when we have those moments of joy, when we start to experience victories in our journey, let's try to embrace those victories fully so that we don't allow the cloud of foreboding joy to take over and to diminish the value and the quality and the excitement of these experiences. It's a protective factor. It's one of those things that we do so that we don't have the, the low of crashing and burning because sometimes people rather just sort of stay at a even tone, you know, emotional mindset rather than allowing ourselves to get too high because the fall, we fear that the fall will be too much, but we actually need those highs. So allow yourself to have those highs. Um, rather than, um, you know, sort of giving in to this idea of foreboding joy. Do not question the joy. Don't stifle the joy. Just embrace the joy with everything you have. For all research and resources displayed on today's show, go to thejoywhisperer.org and click on the episodes link for more information. People want jobs that enhance their qualities of life. Now, if we think about how things have been over the last couple of years, we've got uh, the pandemic, we've had political tension, um, we've had education, um, the, the state of education, particularly for K-12, be really in a state of crisis. Um, and so educators are struggling, um, people in different careers are struggling. And so 
we want careers that enhance the quality of our life when we have in fact been experiencing the opposite. Um, and so for some, the switch to moving indoors or working from home may have been a pleasant transition. That was the case for myself. It was something that wasn't a dramatic change from the life that I already had and in fact um, afforded me a bit more freedom and flexibility in my life. But for others, if we consider childcare challenges, um, larger families in smaller spaces, um, marriages that might have already had levels of tension, that change to working from home could have been and was quite devastating for a lot of people. Um, and so now as we're sort of moving out of that and we're going back into the office in some cases, what are some things that can be done to enhance the quality of our lives um, and so that we can really find purpose and peace and joy in the work that we do? Well, I was looking at an article, a Forbes article, that looked at some of the things that people um, are experiencing in the workplace that has um, really, um, in some cases, made it uh, a rewarding experience and other in other cases, not so rewarding. Um, so looking at some of those things, less than 50% feel that they're in good jobs. Less than 50%. So we have a majority of the workforce that perceive that they're not in good jobs. So what does good jobs mean? A good job, according to this report, is uh, a job that is financially sustainable, but it's also one that allows somebody to uh, dig into their purpose. So it's a purposeful job. It's something that connects with who they are as a person and they find fulfillment in doing that work. And it's also um, a job that has levels of flexibility that enables people to maneuver through their personal lives at ease without having the burden of the job stifling um, the freedom of their, of their personal lives. So those are some of the things that people who um, consider having a good job um, are experiencing. And so to consider that, you know, those factors, less than 50% of the United States are experiencing that. And so most people are in fact experiencing what they consider to be bad job situations. Now, people who have higher levels of education tend to report that their earnings are more satisfactory for their work experience. And we know that, that earnings is part of the puzzle. So that is an important factor. Um, and that those earnings enable them to transfer that to some elements of their personal life. Now, we do know cost of living has gone up, um, and a lot of, in a lot of cases, pay has not gone up. And so in cases where the earnings are actually a satisfactory um, aspect of the job, that's, that's, that's rare. It's not the majority of, um, of Americans in the workforce. Um, another thing is, People who work in um, jobs that seem to lack purpose um, doesn't seem to have an upward career trajectory. There doesn't seem to be any hope to go anywhere else to do a variety of things. Um, but it's really sort of just this one mundane job. Um, those tend to be perceived as jobs that are joyless. They, there, there really isn't a whole lot of joy in those experiences. They also found that by if we break it down by race, by gender, um, we also find that black Americans have less job satisfaction than white Americans. And even more so is the case for black women. And we'll be talking about that and how black women are responding um, to this truth. Uh, the, the last thing is that healthcare is very different than in the past. And so in the past, more of our healthcare benefits were covered, but with the rise in healthcare costs, employers are not covering as much as they did in the past. So these are some of the things that people are grappling with as they search for joy in the workplace. What kinds of things have you had to think about with your own job? Now, keep in mind that people want jobs that enhance the quality of their lives. I know that this is absolutely true for me. I have made it a point to ensure that any job that I have does not take over my personal life, does not infringe 
upon my motherhood does not stifle any of the relationships that I have. And that has been a, a priority for me in ways that maybe, you know, financial compensation has been a priority for others. So I make it a point to just focus in on what I can do to make sure that my job allows me to live the life freely in the way that I um, need to live it in order to um, enjoy my life and be able to travel, to be able to be present for my family. Now, when we look at the different indicators of job satisfaction, you know, there are seven that rise to the top. Um, and the first one is realness. And I love realness because this is one of the things that is just a, a huge priority for me. And this is the ability to just be who you are. Um, I want to be able to laugh heartily if I want to laugh heartily. I want to be able to um, express my concerns, express my joy, just to be free to be who I am without scrutiny in the workplace. So I, I really it prioritize the importance of, of the ability to just be Pam um, in, my, in my workplace settings. Where I'm not able to do that, I bring a fake persona, I hold my breath, and I just deal with it until I leave. There is no way I would last long in a job situation such as that. So realness is, is top priority. Another one is collaboration. And so for those who are a bit more extroverted in nature, I'm a little bit more of an introvert. I like working by myself. I like creating by myself. But I also don't mind opportunities to connect and to collaborate with other colleagues. And this is going to be especially important for people who are extroverts, for people who do thrive in, in the energy of other people. And so jobs that offer opportunities for collaboration, um, whether it's extensive or whether it is um, from time to time, these are the jobs that people tend to find more you know, satisfaction from. The other one is security. You know, and there's, a, there's different types of security. So of course we have financial security, you know, making sure that we can cover the expenses that we have in our lives, making sure we can actually get compensated for, for the work that we've done in a fair way without you know, fear or concern that that compensation isn't going to come through. So that level of security, but also security in terms of our safety, our psychological safety and our physical safety. Um, from the standpoint of psychological safety, am I allowed to speak up or ask questions or dive into conversations that might be a little risky, but it's, you know, safe in that environment to do that. Um, can I trust that the people that I, I work with and, and the supervisors um, that are a part of our team are, you know, going to treat us in a way that's fair and that we don't have to fear our security in those relationships? The next one is inclusiveness. The, this has become really important, and it's always been important, but we're more vocal about this now, um, about our willingness to be inclusive in the workplace, to embrace people who have a wide variety of backgrounds, a wide variety of perspectives. Um, and so to be able to have a workplace that enables that then leads us to the next one, which is belonging. Because to the extent that the organization successfully enables um, inclusivity or creates spaces of inclusivity, it enables us to feel a sense of belonging um, in those spaces. The next one is flexibility. You know, one of the things that I think I find most challenging at, about, you know, organizations, especially when they're unwilling to, to move or to provide, you know, room for real human experiences, um, is, is flexibility. It's really important for us to think about, you know, what does it mean to provide flexibility for our team? Who are the people that are here, what are the unique needs that they have, and how can we ensure that the things that we are offering, the policies that we have, um, the culture that we have, are all elements that enable flexibility in living. Um, if somebody needs time off to take care of a family member, are we counting the days that they're gone and the days that they need to, you know, that they're coming back, or are we tailoring our policies around the needs of the people. Three hours late. What's the deal? I was at your father's funeral. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe that excuse would have fallen when my dad was here, but I'm in charge now. That excuse wouldn't make any sense. 
If your dad was still here. Whoa. In my office now. So this is Power Gear is one of my favorite pastimes, and that is my Color Your Life coloring book series. And in fact, it is a coloring book project that I developed with my cousin, Penny, who is also a life coach. So the Color Your Life coloring book series is a combination of a journal, coloring pages, and reflective um, inspirational messages that can help us as we go forth and think about how we love ourselves, how we can restore ourselves um, from all of life's twists and turns. So go to thejoywhisperer.org and check out the Color Your Life coloring books on the website. You can choose from the coloring book that focuses on loving yourself or the one that is about rebuilding. No matter where you are, you can find a great pastime in your inspirational coloring book. As we talk about the ways in which identity matters in the workplace, um, I have an opportunity to have a, a conversation with Dr. Tolu Huroola to discuss how this might actually play out, particularly um, when we talk about the diversity that exists even within identity. So let's go ahead and dive into that conversation. Well, welcome, Dr. Tolu. It's so good to see you again. Um, I just want to point out that um, you're, you are a racial equity justice researcher um, and a DEI consultant, and you have your own consulting company, which is Magnitude and Bond Consulting. Um, and I, you've been doing this work for a while. I've been following your page and I love um, the insight that you provide. It's no nonsense, it's unapologetic, and I absolutely love your content. And so I'm curious to know, how did you get into this work? Well, thanks for asking. Uh, also, thanks for having me on. It's good to see you again. Uh, so I've been doing racial justice advocacy for a little over 10 years, but uh, working primarily in the DEI space, that's a newer thing for me. So I pivoted to that about two and a half years ago or so around the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. Before that, uh, I had worked at a racial justice nonprofit. And before that, I was teaching uh, racial justice and equity principles uh, at UCLA as a graduate student and a lecturer. Uh, but also, looking at uh, equity uh, and justice issues in the education uh, context, um, because that's that I got, that's where I got my PhD uh, in uh, urban schooling at UCLA. And okay. so um, moving into this work has definitely been a transition, but not a huge transition, because the subject matter is mostly the same. But now we're moving from looking at race within the um, the social and public policy landscape. And we're now looking at race uh, on a more micro level. So we're looking mm -hmm. at race now uh, within organizations. And so right. that's been an exciting change. Uh, that's been interesting. Um, I've had the opportunity to stretch myself intellectually. And so, you know, it's it's been an experience so far. So, you know, I appreciate um, having had the opportunity to be able to pivot into this work. Yeah, I mean, this there's no, um, I guess, more compelling time than now, although it's probably not fair to say because every era has its stuff, right? Um, but we are in knee deep in, in an era of its own right now with um, the, just the, all of the racial tension being brought to light. I mean, just what, 10 years ago, we are a post-racial society. And now we are almost a, you know, a, a society at, a racial war, you know, in, in a lot of different ways. Um, so, so you, you pivoted it into this work. You also have a JD. I mean, how does that play into the, into the work that you do? Well, so you asked me that, um, you know, it's such a, it's such a funny thing because, um, I went to law school, came out in the early 2000s, and I practiced law for the first uh, couple of years of my career, my professional career. And um, it was a really jarring experience. Uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, doing the actual work, the actual intellectual rigor that comes with the work, uh, the research, the being in court, the being uh, in uh, council hearings. All those things have been awesome experiences, but the office politics and the things that go on within law firms, just like yeah. most other professional spaces and how Black women get treated in those spaces, God, it was a real eye opener for me. And so wow. it's crazy because when I left the profession, 
I said that I never wanted to step in a law firm again in any capacity, right? In, wow. in any, you know, any kind of way, right? Uh, and um, I think that one of the reasons why I got into this work is because of my lived experience as a Black woman in a corporate space. And so I think that it has given me um, a firsthand look at what goes on in places like that. Uh, but also the time in between then and now, right? So when I got my racial justice, you know, education, mm-hmm. I've been able to kind of match the experience with the theory, right? With right. what academics have talked about uh, in terms of um, a conceptual lens and the theoretical lenses to basically give language to mm-hmm. what I've experienced and what many Black women like myself have experienced. And so it was, you know, one of the kind of things that I would say, I just kind of a roundabout way got myself back to where I started. Uh, So as a young professional woman, starting out a lawyer, 25 years old, and now as a woman in my early 40s, and being able to look back at that place, but being able to help people by using my lived experience, but then the knowledge that I've gained along the way to be able to give a name to these experiences, Mm -hmm. to explain some of the mechanisms that allow these um, that allow these types of experiences to uh, flourish and then figuring out ways and solutions for solving those kinds of issues, right? Most of what I learned in graduate school were things that Black folks had already known. Black folks had always known. Black folks had always theorized about, right? They might have had fancy names, it didn't come out of the ivory tower, but, you know, as the kids say, you know, we've been knowing, right? Mm -hmm. And so being able to name it, you know, there's power in being able to name it, but I want to be able to point out that we've always known. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. You know, having language to talk about it and to talk, you know, to keep us from talking around it uh, helps a lot, but we've always known. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, so in some ways, it's almost insulting to say, hey, you know, all this research was done. And guess what? There are microaggressions yeah. in the workplace. <laughs> we've, we've been experiencing that. Right. We've been saying it. Yeah. I found that a lot of um, Black folks are exhausted at work. Mm-hmm. Right. Because in right. addition to having to experience all these things. Then now there are these diversity programs. They've been asked to uh, sit on these different committees at work. So it's like on the one hand, you're being asked to participate and helping to change the culture in the office. Right. You're not getting paid to do it. And then you're not seeing the change that you're there to help. Right. And then we have this great contradiction that's happening at the same time. So at the same time that we're having this push for diversity in the workplace, we're having this resistance to telling the truth, um, resistance to critical race theory, resistance um, around what's taught and what's not taught. And so it's sort of this, this double consciousness that we are, that's e- even more pronounced, I think, now than it has been because we are being asked to push for diversity, support those efforts, and also don't do it too much. Just, you know, don't do those things. But, you know, let's let's make things more diverse. Forbes magazine had an article out earlier this um, this year, and I've seen a couple of other articles um, that have followed that. that say that the largest segment of the population that's leaving the workforce and becoming entrepreneurs are black women. And um, and largely not because, yes, we're motivated, we're in you know, we've, we're inspired, we have ideas, but largely also because of the microaggressions that we've experienced in the workplace and we're done, we're exhausted. Is this the way, is this, is this sort of the answer to resolving some of the turmoil that we're experiencing in the workplace? Do these women have something that we all need to be kind of looking at considering? So speaking from my own studies, uh, but also my own personal experience, I would say the answer is yes and no, uh, because I think it depends. It depends on 
precisely what the woman is looking for. So there are huge pros and cons to being an entrepreneur, right? Just like there are, you know, huge pros and cons to being a W-2 employee inside of an organization, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for many of the women who are escaping organizations looking to start their own businesses, often, you know, they've probably experienced, you know, the microaggressions in the office, uh, not being able to get a promotion or being overlooked for a promotion that they probably felt like they deserved, right? And so sometimes you go off on your own so that you can have more agency, right? So you don't have right. to deal with the day-to-day -day of um, people in the office who are either uh, hostile or who are indifferent to you, right? right. Yeah. Then there are uh, the issues around, let's say, leadership, right? If you leave an organization that didn't want to promote you to a middle management position or an upper management position, you go off on your own and you're your own CEO, right? But it doesn't solve everything because one of the, because the, the thing about being Black and being a woman is that the condition of belonging to those identities, it follows you everywhere. Right. Yeah, it does. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that Black women face as an entrepreneur is a lot of us don't have as much access to startup capital that right. our um, uh, counterparts. Right. right. Uh, a lot of us might not uh, be able to um, participate within the entrepreneurial landscape the way that we might want to, because we don't have the same amount of resources that our counterparts have, right? Um, there, was, there was another thing I was thinking of and I lost my train of thought for a minute there. But, oh, so here's another thing that I, I've experienced for myself, right? So you leave an organization, you start your own, your, your own organization. You become the CEO, the founder, the you know lead, whatever, of your own organization. The thing that people don't tell you, though, is that within an organization, you work for the organization, right? You work for a boss, you work for a supervisor, or you're being managed by a supervisor. When you become an entrepreneur, you work for your clients. You're being managed by your clients. You have to do what your clients want you to do, right? Yes. So the racial dynamics that you experience within the office, you right. experience maybe to a lesser degree when you're off on your own, but you still have to experience them. Absolutely. And so there's no real quick fix. There's no way that, you know, nowhere Black women can run to to protect themselves from racism. Racism is a thing. Sexism is a thing. It's a part of our condition. And I think the answer is not necessarily to, um, it's not necessarily for all of us to become entrepreneurs because all entrepreneurs don't succeed, right? Right. It's not so for everyone. About, yeah. There's something about the safety of being a W-2 employee. You're getting a regular check every two weeks. You have health insurance, you have dental. There are some of the things that you get to enjoy when you have the security of working in an organization versus when you're an entrepreneur and you're completely on your own. You don't right. have those um, those benefits. You have to pay out of pocket for those benefits. And so it, it's not a panacea. It's not something that solves the issue for Black women. Those issues will still be there. They just look different. Based on my experience and what I've seen within our social landscape, I have found that Black women are for, far more likely to take on an advocacy role in the workplace, right? And so experiencing racial microaggressions, Black women are probably more likely to voice that they're experiencing that, right? Um, right. You know, part of the reason might be because, you know, the data show that Black women are more likely to experience dissatisfaction at work, right? And so they might just be more likely to be unhappy at work. Uh, I doubt that. I think Black men are unhappy at work as well. Yeah. Uh, and some, I'm not talking about all black people, right? All black women, all black men. I'm talking about some. I think, however, because of the way voicing your displeasure, what, how you're being treated, the way that's perceived, I think a big part of black men's coping strategy is to minimize it and to act mm -hmm. like it doesn't even happen, right? Yeah. Uh, so one of the things that has been really interesting to me is, and, and I've been looking at the research on this, um, their coping strategy is to minimize it, act like it's not there, uh, you know, ask a brother, you know, 
just randomly ask a brother, you know, uh, how do you experience racism in the workplace? And that brother will tell you, oh, I don't really experience it or I don't really see it. I really don't see myself as, you know, this or that or whatever. Or they'll, you know, say something like, yeah, it happens, but you know, it is what it is. You do your job, you go to work, you get your paycheck, you leave, et cetera, et cetera. Right. But tell them you think Black women experience racism at work way more than they do. And then they'll come telling you everything that they've experienced at work, right? And so I think that there is this kind of um, comparative um, experience, right? Where Black men are experiencing racism at work, Black women are experiencing racism at work, but Black women are more likely to speak up about it. I think I would love to see more Black men being um, better allies to Black women in the workplace. Because either our issues don't get elevated or when they do get elevated, we're bearing the burden of bringing them to the fore because we're the ones who are more likely to speak up about the issues that we experience. And Black women well, are less to speak out about and those. when we bring them to the fore, there's also the responsibility of carrying out whatever initiative uh-huh. is put into place as a result there's of that. After work, yeah. right? There's uh, being confrontational. And I don't mean in a... Um, what do you call it? I don't mean in a disruptive way, but being able to say the things that other people don't say. Right. And so you kind of are in a very precarious position when you are advocating for yourself and other people who look like you at work. And so that burden often falls on black women. And it's the kind of thing that shouldn't be happening. Well, it shouldn't be happening altogether, but if we're trying to think about solutions and how we approach these issues, I really would love to see more allyship among uh, Black men and Black women in the workplace. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it. This week's Whisper in My Ear is brought to you by Vera Lofts, where creatives enhance their view. Now this week's question is a really interesting and important one because it's one that I know that I've personally faced in a lot of different scenarios. Um, The question is, how do we best approach the pushback around diversity and inclusion initiatives at work? Whew, this is a heavy one, take a breath. Because this is something that many of us who are very conscious and aware of issues around diversity and inclusion, the lack thereof and so forth, Uh, This is something that we see all the time that we are constantly dealing with and um, that we just can't unsee. You know, once you really become aware of some of the challenges around diversity and inclusion, it's hard to unsee it. So it becomes a part of your, you know, sort of everyday experience. Uh, I mean, an example for me is as a college professor, I am very intentional about the textbooks and the readings and the different media sources that we reference. And I make sure that women women of color, that people of of varying backgrounds are included in um, the offerings of our textbooks, that we make sure that they're written by people of color, that they're written by women. And I often get questioned, where are the books by men? Why don't you have any books for men? And it just really makes me realize how much we have um, blind spots around questions like this, because rarely in classes that are predominantly um, male that, that have resources for the uh, written by men. Do we get the question where are the books for, from people of color, from the LGBT population, and so forth? So it's a very interesting dynamic that I know that I personally deal with. So how do we deal with those kinds of um, concerns? Well, first and foremost, I choose my battles because these approaches can be frustrating and can be exhausting. So choose your battles, and the ones that you do decide to take on. Um, you know, help people see a different vantage point. So if you are up for it, I challenge you to bring people in to see things from a different vantage point. Sometimes a really powerful question can do just that, just as Kendi X. Ibram did on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. One of the arguments you hear um, in opposition to talking to uh, young children or to teaching elementary level school children about racism or the history of racism in America, the argument goes something along the lines of, well, you're going to make white kids feel bad about being white. What what is your response to that? Well, I I would say those people are most concerned about our teaching of slavery. So let's just talk about slavery. Sure. If we teach 
white kids about slavery, we're going to teach them that there were white people who enslaved people and there were black people who were enslaved. And we're also going to teach them that there were white people and black people who challenged and fought against slavery. And, and so my question back to them would, would be, why can't we allow white children to identify with white abolitionists? And More of The Joy Whisperer coming up. We can pursue thriving businesses with friends and with family. Now, this is one that is a bit controversial because both the research and popular public opinion says that it is not that businesses that are grounded in friends particularly um, don't tend to thrive. Um, in fact, there was a study that said that 40% of businesses that are started with friends tend to fail. So that's a very interesting dynamic there. Um, and I can see how, how this could absolutely be the case. But I think it's time for us to start looking at this with a bit of a different lens because there are many examples of people who have started and have run business businesses with friends and it has gone quite well. So I, Beyonce and Kelly comes to mind. They've been best friends since childhood. They have grown their entertainment businesses together. They built them separately as um, a benefit of having built a, an amazing um, group together. And now they are still best friends and still come together for various projects at times. So that's one really great example. Um, another one, um, Steve Jobs and Daniel Kotke, they both, Kotke, they both have uh, went to college together and Daniel was actually among one of the first employees for Apple. Um, and so sometimes bringing friends on board or beginning initiatives with friends can be a really smart way to do things because you've got, you've already sort of got this built in person that you know, that you trust, um, and that you can understand a little bit about their personality. So there's not a whole lot of surprises that may come into play. Now there's an article that was written by Eric Shapiro. He is the co-founder of ArcTouch and he actually co-founded his business with one of his best friends from college. And that was with um, Adam Fingerman. And they talk about how they were able to build this business and do it together and make a joint decision to sell that business um, in, and do quite well in selling that business. So here's how um, Eric recommends being able to go into business with a friend. So number one, honestly vet each other. So what does that mean? Just in the same way that you would interview somebody that you don't know, take the same level of effort and energy and time to ask each other questions and dive in deep about each other's values, about what you want from the business, about how you'll handle conflict, um, really vet each other, even if they are emotionally healthy and stable enough to move into a business venture together. These are all things that are really important. Um, and so you don't have to act like you don't know each other and, oh, we're going to have this mock interview process. But it's really just a matter of having a deep, clear, transparent, serious conversation about what the two of you are going to venture into. The next one is to have short-term memory. There are going to be times where there are clashes, there are disagreements, there's tension. But how do you move past those moments? Now, if you are you know, planning on partnering with somebody who holds grudges, who does not know how to let things go, then that is a red flag in moving forward with that person. I don't care how much of a best friend they are. We have to be very honest with each other and with ourselves about what is going to work in terms of creating a thriving biz business versus what's going to create roadblocks. So having short-term memory. The, second, the third one is to make your friendship an asset and not an obstacle. So what are the elements of your friendships of your friendship that will bring strengths to the business? What are the elements of your friendships that um, you, know, you can bring together and move forward in, in order to benefit from what each other has to bring to the table? The other one is to make sure you are invested, both invested in financially is what they recommend, but also being able to um, find out how are they both able to, how are you both able to invest 
in this venture together. So for some, it might be my time. For others, it might be that I'm sacrificing quitting my job. For others, it might be I'm putting this financial piece into it. And then the last one is divide and conquer. So what are some of the things that you are really good at and what are some of the things that they are really good at that both of you can own so that you can each have a piece that makes sense in terms of your responsibilities with the business? So it is possible, it is absolutely possible to go into business with friends, but you have to be mindful and strategic about how it's done. This week's Inbox Gem is from Deepak Chopra as he talks about the difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is always for a reason. Joy is happiness for no reason. <laughs> to be joyful, you have to be independent of the good and bad opinions of the world, immune to criticism, responsive to feedback, beneath no one, and above no one, and totally fearless. That is joy. So let me tell you about my own journey about launching businesses and bringing friends into the fold. Now, for many of you, you may not know, but I am the founder and CEO for the Academy of Creative Coaching and Tandem Light Press. Academy of Creative Coaching is a coach certification program for people who want to be professional coaches in a wide range of areas like financial coaching, educational coaching, relationship coaching, etc. And Tandem Light Press is a publishing company that really makes publishing accessible for people who traditionally may not be accepted for the large publishers. We're developmental in nature, so we'll take a, an author that shows promise and help them create a book that is award-winning, best-selling, and so forth. So those are the two companies that I have started and that have um, really been thriving. And so I've managed to pull together a team, an amazing team, for both companies and largely who comprise of people that I know personally, people that I've gotten to know maybe on a professional level, but also people who um, I have known you know, for years. So I've had a few different ways that um, I've gone about making sure that the people that I bring to the team are people that um, will you know, bring positive, a positive contribution. To the experience. Now, a lot of this has been trial and error. Everybody doesn't work out, right? It's just the way that things work in life. You know, sometimes we get into relationships, they don't last. Uh, sometimes we get married, we get divorced. <laughs> there are just, by the pure nature of human engagement and connection, everything does not always work out. So what I've noticed, though, is that those relationships that do work out in within my business that have, you know, that are actual friendships as well. Um, they show different characteristics than the ones that may not last quite so long. Um, and I will add that, so with the way that I engage with the friends in my business is I still maintain those friendships. And in some ways they stay separate, but in some ways they also are integrated into the experience of the business and make really the culture and create the culture of the business. So we'll still go out to dinner. We might hang out at night and, and some of those things. Um, but when it comes down to the business, we also still bring our real personalities um, to the table. So what I've noticed is that with people, it is an aspect of trial and error. So there's three, three keys to how it's worked for me in terms of bringing friends into the business. So the first element is people. Allow for trial and error. Understand what people bring to the table. And within that, understand that, at least in my case, those people that stayed with us and that really grew um, tend to be those people that were in, within my core circle, the people that I really trust, that know me well, that believe in me, that are my biggest cheerleaders. They were the ones that really stuck around the most and gave the greatest contributions. Now, I've also had people within my, my um, sort of my community that are you know, friends, but they're not like my core, but they're my friends and we get along and they believe in me and they're, you know, uh, we're supportive of one another. We're like-minded in a lot of ways. Now, they have come along in some cases and have been a part of certain aspects of the company. They may not last forever, but they have a, a powerful contribution to make um, through different seasons of the company's development. 
And the third one, um, I brought on people who are actually threats to my community and I just didn't know it. And so I've learned over time that, you know, there are people who are jealous. They're there to um, learn and, and take from some of your strategies. They are indifferent to what you're going through and what you're experiencing in life. Um, and some actually tend to be vindictive. And I have learned the hard way that some of those people can infiltrate into your business um, disguised as friends. Now, this doesn't happen so often, or it hasn't happened so often that I need to have all the alerts on, but know that these kinds of things absolutely do happen. So that's what you want to consider with the people element. The next element is the joy factor, making sure that we are able to freely engage in demonstrations of joy. And for those of you who are familiar with my models of joy, there are four demonstrations of joy. There's the ethos, which is our character and who we are and what we bring to the table. There is our expression, how we you know, express that joy. There is the emotion, how we feel around the joy, and then those experiences that we create around joy. All four of those are a key part of my experience within my organization for the people involved. And then the last one is the yin and yang strength compatibility. So what I don't have, my teammates have. And what my teammates have, I don't have in terms of strengths and talents and what we bring to the table. So those elements of people, the joy factor and the yin and yang compatibility are three keys to what's made it work for me in terms of working with my friends. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode of The Joy Whisperer. I hope that you would consider what it takes to create joy in your own workplace. Join me here every week on Roku TV on the SSN TV channel at noon every Thursday. Also, find me on social media on Instagram at Whispering Joy or on my LinkedIn page. And remember, joy is our greatest energy source for our relationships, our resistance, our resilience, and our restoration. Have an amazing week. Brought to you in part by Vera Lofts, where creatives enhance their view. Mm -hmm.